Welcome to the Empowered Wife Podcast, where it's all about fixing your relationship without your man's conscious effort so that you feel desired and taken care of and special, even if your relationship feels completely hopeless. I'm Laura Doyle, and today I'm talking about how to cope with the threat of divorce. I'm going to cover three ways to heal your hurt, restore your dignity, and revive your love. Four months ago, my guest Abby's husband left her and said there was a zero chance that they would reconcile. He said so many hurtful things, she wasn't even sure she wanted to save her marriage. She didn't really think she could, but she did. And her husband told her and his mother that he wants to love Abby deeply. They have big plans for their future together, including starting a family. Then I'll be giving out the Worst Relationship Advice of the Week Award, which is a hope-crushing cop-out disguised as, quote, being realistic. All that is coming up, but first, let's talk about how to cope with the threat of divorce. When I was on the brink of divorcing my husband, I was desperate to end the pain of constantly feeling rejected and lonely. I also hoped to escape the financial chaos we were stuck in and dreamed of finding a man who would better match me than the loser pants I had married. Convinced it was my husband's fault that I was so unhappy, I managed to avoid looking at my own contributions to the tension, the hostility, and the pain in my marriage. I was sure I was the good spouse, and the marriage counselors even said so. I didn't realize I was avoiding the door marked, reflect on your shortcomings. And I would have gone on my self-righteous way if my marriage hadn't been failing. Looking back, I realized that I not only contributed to the breakdown of my marriage, I was chipping away at the intimacy and connection on a daily basis. Nobody had ever taught me the six intimacy skills, which are critical to having a playful, passionate relationship. My parents are divorced, so I was following a failed recipe. Maybe nobody ever taught you either. The good news is that the aching heartbreak in my marriage led to an incredible transformative journey that I never would have taken any other way. Today, I'm deeply grateful for the breakdown and for the woman I've become as a result. That's why I'm so passionate about ending world divorce and why I started an international coaching company and wrote several books to make sure every woman knows how to prevent a divorce by making her marriage amazing. Here are three ways the breakdown in your marriage can become your breakthrough. Number one, find ways to respect the man you married. And one of the things that had gone terribly wrong in my marriage was that I had stopped respecting my husband. I didn't realize that respect is like oxygen for men or or that like love, respect is a decision or that my being respectful would go such a long way toward restoring peace and courtesy too. Why does your husband deserve your respect? Well, because you chose him. You wouldn't have picked a jerk. Even if he seems like one now, that's not who he truly is. One way to bring out his higher self, even if you haven't seen that side of him in a long time, is to show him respect. I desperately wanted a respectful marriage, but what I didn't realize is that, to paraphrase Gandhi, I had to be the change I wanted to see in my marriage by bringing the respect first. One woman was astonished that when she apologized to her verbally abusive ex-husband for the years of disrespect she had shown, he not only softened but offered to do her laundry when she was sick, even though they'd been separated for years. You may prefer to do your own laundry, but giving your husband respect has magical powers to restore your own dignity and, and pave the way to having the kind of relationship you want in the future. If you're willing to try this respect experiment, consider saying or emailing or texting him these words. I apologize for being disrespectful when I dismissed you or interrupted you or rolled my eyes or argued with you last week at the kids' party or for all those years. If you can be quiet after that, no justifying or defending or restating your point, You'll give yourself an unfair advantage in healing your marriage. Number two, find ways to make yourself ridiculously happy. The threat of divorce has a way of making you cry in your Cheerios or your Riesling or the two together, which seems like a reasonable meal when your heart is broken. I'm not saying to squash that heartache down or to dismiss it, 
Of course, those feelings need their day in the sun. You're having them for a reason. Even so, consider purposely doing things at least three a day for frivolous fun, like riding your bike, taking a bath or a nap, or getting out the paints or your guitar. Play with your pets. Have coffee with a friend. Call your sister. Sing at the top of your lungs and play words with friends. Do things to delight yourself, even if they cost money, like a mani-pedi or a massage. Here's why this matters so much. When my marriage was at the lowest point, I thought my husband was doing a lousy job making me happy. It turns out that important job is mine, not his. Only happy people have happy relationships, and I'd lost sight of whose responsibility it was to make me happy. I'd gotten used to being miserable, which is no way to go through life. You may still find yourself feeling weepy, but making it your priority to fill yourself up to the point of giddiness will not only help you cope better, it could just save your marriage because it will restore your confidence and make you more attractive at the same time. You may feel selfish doing three things that delight you every day at first, but think of all the people who depend on you. Then put your own oxygen mask on first. That's what self-care is, taking responsibility for your own happiness. If you're anything like I was, it will be challenging to figure out what you like to do. That's okay. You'll get the hang of it and you'll start to feel amazing in no time. Number three, say I can't and ouch, instead of biting the bait. If you're still in the ring going five rounds with your husband about custody, finances, or selling the house, it's a good bet that he's baiting you by saying things that he knows will make you react. He makes a snide remark, he insults you, or he ropes the kids into the mud when you're trying to protect them. It's exhausting and it's stressful. Consider reacting with no reaction. Let his head explode that you're not defending, throwing back insults, or rushing in to protect the kids even. That may sound like crazy talk, but I've seen it work wonders in restoring peace in the family. Emma felt so empowered when her estranged husband called to say that she had to come pick up their daughter's forgotten end-of-semester schoolwork at his house or her daughter would suffer the consequences. Her calm response was, I can't. It was shorthand for... I can't make that drive without being resentful. She didn't say that part, nor did she engage in a conversation about it beyond those two powerful words. Her husband upped the bait by attacking her and saying that it was on Emma if their daughter had to repeat the sixth grade, which felt like huge bait. But she simply said, ouch, and nothing else. No defending, no arguing, no negotiating. Her husband not only made the drive to get the schoolwork himself, he later texted an apology like she'd never seen in all the years they'd been married. She was moved by how accountable he was. Who knew that she could get the words she'd been longing for by saying next to nothing? I certainly didn't know that before I learned the intimacy skills either, so the pain of feeling lonely and hopeless built until I felt completely hopeless. Luckily, I was too embarrassed to go through with the divorce. So I asked women who had happy marriages for their secrets. And that's how I learned that being successful in marriage is a skill. It's like playing piano. It's not just a matter of luck, like playing roulette. But there was no Relationships 101 course at my school, and I bet there wasn't one at yours either. That's not your fault. Here's the upside I see now. Without excruciating pain, I would not have started this journey. I wouldn't have the 30-year marriage of my dreams to the same man that I once thought was a loser pants. Now, I hate to see anyone suffer unnecessarily. I want every woman to have not only the six intimacy skills, but also the connection framework, a coach and a like-minded community and and a way to share what she's learned, to pay it forward. And you may think that being on the brink of divorce is the wrong time to learn intimacy skills. But that heartbreak was the doorway to something wondrous for me. And it can be for you too. To quote Maya Angelou, I wouldn't take nothing for my journey now. Don't let the pain go to waste. 
If you're wondering how to get started with fixing your relationship and making it shiny again, then you need a roadmap. Get six simple steps to follow that will set your relationship up for success. Discover three common mistakes that wives make trying to fix their relationship that just make things worse. When you download my free Adored Wife Roadmap, you can do that at GetCherished.com. Go to GetCherished.com now to get your roadmap in minutes. Four months ago, my guest Abby's husband left her and said there was zero chance that they would reconcile. He was doing the paperwork to file for divorce while his mother was cheering him on. He said so many hurtful things, she wasn't even sure she wanted to save her marriage. She didn't really think she could, but she did. And her husband told her and his mother that he wants to love Abby deeply. They have big plans for their future together, including starting a family. Abby, welcome to the Empowered Wife Show. Thank you so much for coming on. Hi, Laura. Thanks for having me. So take us back four months ago. There was a big breakdown. What happened? There was. My husband and I got married in September, so we had only been married for a few months. And we had probably one big breakdown every single month after the wedding. And then the biggest breakdown came around New Year's Eve. And he came upstairs and he just said, you know, that he was done and he wanted a divorce. And I said, you know, are you, are you sure? And he said, I'm a hundred percent sure. And I said, I don't think I want you in the house while we're going through this process. And so he packed a bag. I didn't know where he was going, but he packed a bag and he wheeled the bag out the door and didn't say goodbye. And I chased after him and cursed him out, which I'm not proud of. And he flew to London to live with his mom. Wow. And you're here. I didn't even know he was going to London, but that's where he went. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So this felt like the end of your pretty new marriage, like you're three months in. Yep. He had already told me several times that he had made a mistake. Wow. Ouch. Very painful. So you're thinking, were you thinking at this point, okay, yeah, I, I want a divorce too. Like this is not working for me. Um, at first I was the, you know, the first few hours I would say I was like, yeah, I'm, I'm done too. This is just too much. And then, of course, I got really sad and then mad and went through all all the stages of grief. And um, it was just, you know, I'm not proud of my behavior in that time. I sent him a bunch of emails telling him, outlining everything he did wrong. Um, Yeah, you're right. Which he shared with, you know, family members. and, And, oh, no. And so it, it, it just got really, it got really messy and, um, and neither of us were our best selves. And he, yeah, he, um, I believe he started the process like immediately to divorce me. So, and from your perspective, what was he doing wrong? Like what was having you feel like, yeah, I'm out. Oh man, everything. I thought it was pretty much almost all him. <laughs> So he, he was, um, he raged a lot. And from my perspective at the time, it was, he rages over the smallest things, you know, zero to 60, just awful anger. Um, when I was just, I didn't even understand why he was upset. And so I would be left there, you know, trying to catch up. Like, why is my husband yelling right now? I don't even know what I did. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I genuinely didn't know what I did. And then I would just cry and cry and cry. And then he would yell at me for crying more. Oh, uh, so it was, it was just very painful. Yeah. And scary in a way, right? Because how are you? And scary. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm five foot two and he's almost six foot two. So. <laughs> oh, did you fear for your safety at times? Yeah, I did. He, he never got physical with me, but there were some times when I thought he might. Yeah. Yeah. And I think one of the things that happens too, when there's a rageaholic, I mean, I think there's kind of this shame or embarrassment that comes up like, I shouldn't be putting up with this kind of thing. Was that, was that there for you? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I had told my, I had actually told my mom about it 
And my mom was like, I, I, I love him, but this is all really scary what you're telling me. And I don't really know what I think about this anymore. I, I, I definitely, you know, I, I consider myself a strong woman and a feminist. And I'm like, I'm putting up with this same sort of treatment that was, you know, how my dad treated me growing up, honestly. So, yeah. So then there's a, almost this thing of like, oh, okay, I went out and married my dad. I recreated what I knew, <laughs> right? Which I think is also terrifying because then you think, okay, that was a mistake. I shouldn't be in this situation. Yeah. So my, my therapist at the time was not thrilled. Yeah. <laughs> Were people telling you to leave him? Um, she didn't tell me to leave, but she did caution me quite a bit. <laughs> okay. Okay. Like this might not be fixable. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. Okay. So, all right. So he's in London, he's filling out divorce papers and um, what happened? Well, I'm I'm just doing exactly the opposite of what I should have been doing and emailing him all the time, you know. Um, and then he he blocked me, so I couldn't email him anymore, and or text him or WhatsApp. I mean, he blocked me on all the things. And uh, so I emailed his dad, who's a social worker, and was like, "This is all of James' problems. He's your responsibility now," which was awful and horrible. And then um, his dad forwarded it to his mom and sister. And, you know, they blocked me and everybody just, I I haven't talked to his family since they never responded to me. And um, my husband was like, I made the right call, you know, because I was acting like a crazy person. And um, he's like, "I, I definitely made the right call. Thank you for confirming that. Wow. So it got a lot worse. Yeah. For got better. It sounds like. Yeah. And then we didn't talk really for like a month. No talking at all. No communication. He, well, no, he blocked me. So I went through my mom to talk about like financial stuff. Um, my mom would text him and he was very generous with finances. Um, and uh, so, yeah. So in February, about a month, a little over a month later, I decided to spend a week in Florida with my um, one of my best girlfriends. And we came up with a, a new business idea together, <laughs> which now isn't happening because of coronavirus, unfortunately. Maybe it will someday. But um, it was so exciting. And I was just, I don't know, I felt reinvigorated. And I was looking forward to my my new life without him. So you were making plans. You were moving along. Oh, yeah. I was making plans. I was like, I'm still going to... We had planned to move to Florida when our lease was up at the end of June. And I was like, I'm still going to do that. I'm going to start a new business in Florida. And I'm going to have a great life. Um, You know, I'm 36. So I was like, I probably ran out of time to have biological kids. So I'll just be single forever and adopt in my 40s. And that was my new plan. Oh, wow. <laughs> so it's, I mean, it's a good plan, but I also hear like the heartbreak behind it in a way. It was, it was really heartbreaking. It was really heartbreaking. And then I, I was, I was praying a lot. I was praying all the time <laughs> and I just kind of heard this message and felt like I, you know, God told me I need to save my marriage. And so I, like, how How would I do that? (laughs) I I was, I was seriously, I was talking to God and I was like, seriously, God, like, there's no way this marriage can be saved. Like, I know you can do everything, but look at the situation. Like, it is not possible. Yeah. Way too broken. So I'd been emailing with um, our like rabbi marriage counselor guy, and he suggested that I look up your book. Which book? Um, it was the, uh, surrendered wife, the surrendered wife. Okay. Which I, you know, as a feminist, I was like, mm-hmm. you're like, no, thanks. <laughs> yeah. And he was like, no, you just kind of have to trust me on this one and read it. <laughs> and you were open. You were willing to do that. Cause I, yeah, you know, I love reading. I love learning new information. I thought, you know what? I'm just gonna like stuff my pride down a little bit and read this book. 
And I read it and I was like, oh my gosh, I've done so much wrong. <laughs> oh, so a little bit of a humbling. Yeah, it really, it was. Like. it really was. So then what did you do? Well, I looked up your um, Facebook group and I joined that. And, um, and then I got some emails, you know, from, from you or your team being like, sign up for coaching. And I was like, no, I, I don't think that this will work for me. It's, it's, this is for women whose problems have been way less than mine. <laughs> right. Right. I think that's and, really uh, common. Yeah. 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 So then I, I started reading like your articles online and sort of just like watching people interact in the Facebook group and then I decided, you know what, I'm not going to forgive myself if I, if, if I just say, you know what, God, I'm not going to listen to you. <laughs> I'm going to do my own thing. And um, so I thought, you know, I, I have to at least give it a try. So I, I signed up for your, your diamond program. I just went straight to, I was like, what's the best one? I'm just going to do it. I'm and getting I a private coach. Program. And what's yeah, that? I was like, I was like, I don't really have that much money, but I'm going to put it on my credit card. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, um, it was risky. This was a big risk for you to take, to make that. Investment. It was because of, um, coronavirus, you know, uh, <laughs> my entire career is just offline for who knows how long. And, and my husband had left and I was, I was on my own and I had no idea how I was going to make money for the next at least year while this whole coronavirus thing shakes down. And uh, it was scary. It was it was definitely scary to make that investment. It was an act of faith. It was an act of faith. It was absolutely an act of faith. And so um, I had my first coaching call, and I think I was like kind of negative, and I was like, "Yeah, this isn't going to work for me." And then I changed coaches. Um, I mean, I didn't. You guys sent me a message and was like, "Oh, we have to change your coach." And I was like, "Okay, that's great." And um, then I had my new coach, Stephanie, and I was like, "Okay, I'm more." For some reason, I was just like more comfortable, and I started thinking, you know, I have to put faith over fear. And so I just jumped in. I was like, "I'm gonna dedicate myself. I want to give it my all. I don't want to." you know, do things halfway. So whether I, what I think about, you know, surrendering and, and, you know, sub submitting and being respectful and all of these things, I was like, I, I don't know what I think about this, but I'm just going to do it. I'm going to do it by the book. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Where did you get that? Where did you get that? Um, like that? Cause that takes some grit, I think, to kind of find that commitment in yourself especially when things are looking so bleak. How'd you do that? Oh man, uh, God, honestly. I mean, it really, it was a God thing. <laughs> Just leaning, leaning into your faith. Oh, absolutely. I was, I was, I was praying for a long times every single night and I was just like, God, show me the way. Yeah. Nice. And, uh, just, just, really working as hard as I, as hard as I could. And, and a lot of times I, I just, you know, I'd go back <laughs> and say to God, I, I, this is, this is too hard. This is too hard. You know, I don't think I can do this. And, uh, I just kept hearing, keep going, keep going, keep going. So even when I didn't feel like it, I had to just keep going. And so what did you first start doing differently than you had been doing before? Oh, man. I mean, duct tape. <laughs> that was my first biggest skill was duct tape. That's a big one. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I just, I realized how much I was shutting my husband down. Mm -hmm. And that, I was really sad about that. And, you know, he's, he's, he's an introvert. And he doesn't talk a lot or express himself a lot. And I do. So I, you know, I, I was just, I was shutting him down and I didn't even realize it. And very, I'm very opinionated. So, you know, I tell him, oh, you're not going to do that, are you? Yeah. And, um, and then, I, you know, I realized, 
of course that made him angry. I mean, not that it's okay to rage at anybody, but like, of course that made him angry. He lived with somebody that was just shutting him down all the time and not valuing him really. So, so duct tape's the first thing I did. Um, so I actually used doing taxes as a sort of window into like, maybe I can sort of crack this window and stick a little foot in, maybe start climbing in. I love it. I love it. Any, <laughs> any excuse will do. And so at this point, are you still kind of incommunicado? Cause if you're using duct tape, it makes, so it sort of sounds like maybe you were having some interactions with him at that point. Oh yes. Yeah. So the first, the first skill Yes. Rewind. You're totally correct. So the first skill was during taxes, he unblocked me and we had to discuss some things. And so I started, I didn't start by sending gratitudes or apologies. I started by being goddess of fun and light. So I was cracking jokes and I was sending him funny memes that had nothing to do with our relationship just trying to engage him. So I did that for about a week and didn't really get much of a response. And then he started being funny back and I was like, Oh, okay. And then, um, and then I started with appreciations with gratitude and just, you know, making lists of everything I'm grateful for that he does. And, you know, one of them was how, how generous he's been. He's been very generous financially And so I told him that I was like, thank you for taking care of me. And, you know, you're, I really admire how, how generous you've been throughout this whole process. And the next week he got a bonus at work, which I wouldn't have even known about if he didn't tell me. And he sent me exactly the amount of money that this program cost. Unbelievable. Uh, and I was unbelievable. Like, so you didn't know you put it on your credit card. And you thought, well, I don't know how that's going to get paid. Mm-hmm. And he r- sort of randomly sent you the exact amount. Randomly. Wow. Love that story. Yeah. I was like, wow. <laughs> <laughs> so you probably took encouragement from that. Like, okay, I'm, I'm on the right path. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, you know, I did take that as a sign from God that I was on the right path <laughs> because I was like, that's, that's eerie. <laughs> that is eerie. And so, and how did he respond to you? You started giving him the gratitude. You expressed it to him. Yeah, lots of gratitude. Okay, and you were also being um, kind of just fun. You're being silly and playful and yeah, light. So, how did he respond to that? Or was there any um, difference? Yet? Cautious, very cautious. And I said one day, you know, I need to move one of the one of the big house plants, but I, I can't move it myself. I'm not strong enough. And, and he just said, okay, well, I'll come over Saturday and move it for you. I hadn't. So he was back in um, the New York city area at this point okay. and for work. And I, I was like, I haven't seen him for, you know, I think at that point, two and a half months or whatever it was and, or two months and I was so nervous. So when he came over, I like dressed up pretty and I was just like smiling and bubbly and, um, and he was just like, you know, shut down and gruff really. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and he moved the plant and was like, I'm leaving now. And I was like, Oh, and he's like, well, you know, what did you expect, Abby? And I was like, and I, I was like, well, I was, I was hoping, you know, I don't know. I just, I feel so happy to see you. So sweet. <laughs> and then, you know, he said, he said some, you know, harsh words and then I started crying and then he left. Oh, ouch. And so I was like, this is pointless. But then later that evening he texted me that I looked really nice and he liked my hair. Yay. <laughs> so just this little tiny bit of encouragement to keep going. It sounds like yeah. small, really small. Yeah. <laughs> but but you got excited. You got happy. I did. I did. I got really excited and I saw that. <laughs> and I was like, okay, good. I'm going to, because, you know, in that couple hour window of time, I was like, you know, back to, oh, this, this is pointless. Why? I feel like such a fool. I was like, I got all dressed up and, you know, excited for nothing. And, um, and then, so when I got that, I was, I was like, okay, I'll keep going. I'll keep going. And then 
um, a couple days later, I texted him, you know, some funny things and he texted back and, um, and then I kept texting him appreciations. And then I, and then I texted him an apology. I'm sorry for being disrespectful and, you know, named a lot of things from our, our separation, me writing the emails to him, to his family. And, uh, he responded well, he was just like, thank you. I mean, it was pretty short, but it was like, thank you. And then he asked how I was doing with quarantine. And I said, you know, it's, it's really hard for me because I have, um, an autoimmune disorder. So I, I was like, I can't really leave the house very much. And there's really no groceries in the area. Cause at that time, everybody was panicking. And so he said, well, I'll come over Saturday. And he brought me a bunch of groceries. Wow. He wanted to be your hero again. Yeah. So that was really amazing. So I was, I didn't expect much. I thought he was just going to deliver the groceries and leave, but I had baked banana bread the night before and he really likes my banana bread. So I said, do you want a piece of banana bread? And he said, no, no, thank you. And I said, oh, okay, well, I'm, I'm, I want a slice, so I'm going to have one. And then he's like, okay, I'll have one. And, uh, so I, I cut the banana bread and put it down on the table for us. And, and he just started talking and I used my duct tape and I hear you. And he talked for about six hours straight. Six hours. The introvert husband. Yep. Wow. Wow. So this is a breakthrough. This was a big day. Yeah, that was that. I think that was my huge breakthrough. That was my moment. And I was like, this might be working. So inside where you're going, yay. Yeah. I really <laughs> but on the I, outside. I, I was sitting and listening to some hard feelings, you know, that he was saying, but I just, I just kept duct tape. I hear you and just really listen to him. And what do you know? When I don't talk, he talks a lot. Wow. Surprise, surprise. <laughs> so, and he was saying some things that could have made you defensive. It sounds like. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But you didn't defend. I didn't, I didn't defend. I just, I really wanted to hear him and listen to him. And I just thought, you know, there's a lot at stake here and I just need to pretend my mouth is actually duct tape. (laughs) (laughs) I just kept picturing that. I was like, um, and I, I really did want to hear him too, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, how did, how did you end up now you're reconciled, you're back together. So how did that happen? Well, he started coming over every weekend. Wow. Yeah. Oh, so that was the beginning. That was his yeah, first that time. Was the beginning. Now he yeah. comes every weekend. Yeah. So that was, I think, early March, early or mid March. And he started coming over every weekend. And the next time he came over, um, I was pretty shocked because he was like, Can I have a hug? And I was like, Yeah, of course, sure. And then, and then he kissed me. And, um, which was very shocking. And then, and then we, we made love. Wow. So you probably had like butterflies in your stomach, like, oh my gosh, what's happening? Yeah. Wow. And so what's your relationship like now? Oh, it's amazing. (laughs) I have, I have the perfect husband. I really do. Oh, I mean, he's he's so amazing. I mean, not that he's perfect because we're all flawed, of course, but we're, we're closer than we've ever been, even when we were first dating or friends, because we were we were friends before. We were actually roommates before. Um, that's how we met. Wow. And, um, so now he's very sweet and affectionate. And this is a guy that is like, I'm not very affectionate, you know? And he used to need a lot of alone time. And he would take he would take so much a long time. Like I'd have to really fight to get him to spend time with me. Mm. And that turned into like a point of contention where before, and then now he's just like, he's with me as much as he can be. Wow. When he's he's not working or has, you know, another obligation or something, he's, he's, he wants to be with me. He wants to be right with you. Yeah. And the fighting for attention part from before like that, that hasn't come back. Not at all. No, not at all. I mean, I just, I feel so like cared for and loved and, um, you know, we, we read the Bible together every day and we pray together every day, which is really intimate. 
um, to have that time with the two of us. And um, he's very on board with uh, us being one flesh now, which is like exciting for me. (laughs) Wow, that is exciting. And I love this part where he said he wanted to love you more deeply. Tell me about that. So at first, he was saying things like, you know, that he didn't really love me, but he was reconciling for God. Mm. And I was, I was like, this is so painful. And then he explained it to me that he's reconciling for God and he has feelings for me and he's attracted to me, but he didn't love me the way that um, the Bible says you're supposed to love your wife. And he wanted to learn to love me like that. Wow. Oh, that's so sweet. <laughs> that, was, that was not painful at all. It sounds yeah. wonderful. Yeah, so that's, that was a turning point too where I was just like, this is so painful. And, uh, and then, and then I, I understood him and was like, wow. That's, yeah, it was just really amazing. You guys have big plans, right? We do. We do. Tell me about um, that. So he asked me um, a few weeks ago when I said, you know, the, our, our lease is up soon. Um, you know, what do you want to do about it? And he was like, well, what do you want to do? And I was like, I want to move to Florida. <laughs> Express your desires. I did. Yeah. Cause that, that was our plan before to move to Florida at the end of June. And so I just said, you know, pure desire. I want to move to Florida. Was it? And he said, he said, okay, well I'll, I'll email my boss and see if I can work remote. So the next day he emailed his boss and um, they, they approved for him to work remote the rest of the year, at least we'll see after that. um, So, so we're going and we're buying a car today um, and we're going to drive down to Florida at the end of the month with our two cats. And we're, we're going to start trying to have a baby. Which is really exciting. So exciting. And that was a big desire of yours to be a mom. Yeah. And I think before he was kind of like, oh, you know, like you just, you're in a marriage so that you can have a baby. And I was like, well, I do want a baby, but I'm in a marriage with you because I love you. And now he's just like, he's, he said he's excited to, um, to have kids with me and have a family with me. So. Wow. Must've been music to your ears. It really was when he said that, when he said he was excited to be a dad and have a family with me, I was like, thank you, God, this is amazing. This is exactly everything I asked for. (laughs) Wow. So your breakdown really was the breakdown before the breakthrough. It really was. I think our, our marriage had to completely break down to be rebuilt on solid ground, you know? Makes sense. So what would you say to a woman whose husband is saying, I'm out, I'm filing divorce, there's zero chance, we're getting back together, I don't love you, mm-hmm. she's there now. What's your tip for her? Uh, faith over fear. I mean, sometimes sometimes faith is... is just a practice and not even a feeling. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. You know, that's, I just had to keep putting one foot in front of the other, regardless of how I felt. So what's a way she could choose her faith over her fear? Would you say? Oh man. I mean, you know, look for the evidence. Like you say, I, I kept a very long list of evidence, even even when it was hard and there was lots of other evidence to the contrary, I just chose to, you know, take my thoughts captive and focus on, <laughs> focus on the positive, focus on, you know, um, the evidence that, that gave me proof that he loved me and wanted to be with me. Love that. That's great. And what would you say to Abby, if you could go back, knowing what you know now, what would you say to her back then? Oh, Wow. Just that I didn't need to be in so much pain. Tell me more about that. You know, I was in, I was just in agony and just crying all the time after he left. And I would just say, you know, just, just trust and have faith. This is all for a reason. Everything it's these lessons you're learning right now are going to lead to a beautiful marriage. Beautiful. 
she would have been really happy to hear that, huh? Yeah. <laughs> Definitely. Well, fantastic. This is so inspiring. I just want to make it clear. You're not a coach. You just, you're just a student and pretty new, really just a couple months in, yeah. right? How, when did you, like, how many, how long has it been actually? Let me oh, geez. You. Um, I think it's, let's see. It's been three, three months in the program. Three months in the program. Okay, cool. So, so this is a pretty dramatic change in a pretty short time in a way. You agree? It, it really is. It really is. Yeah. It's amazing. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Well, this is, I think you gave a lot of hope to uh, a woman who's listening right now. She's thinking her marriage is hopeless. Uh, maybe she's blocked. Her husband won't speak to her. They're totally incommunicado. But um, if you can cause that kind of transformation and really fix your marriage like that, uh, like you have, then uh, I'm sure she's feeling really encouraged. So thank you so much for sharing about all these personal matters. Really Absolutely. Important. Thank you so much for having me on. I'm really excited to um, hopefully give some hope to some women that were in the same situation that I was or someone. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much, Abby. Thank you, Laura. If you're wondering how to get started with fixing your relationship and making it shiny again, then you need a roadmap. Get six simple steps to follow that will set your relationship up for success. Discover three common mistakes that wives make trying to fix their relationship that just make things worse. When you download my free Adored Wife Roadmap, you can do that at GetCherished.com. Go to GetCherished.com now to get your roadmap in minutes. And now it's time for the Worst Relationship Advice of the Week Award. It's the Worst Relationship Advice of the Worst Relationship Advice. Yeah, it's the Worst Relationship Advice of the Worst Relationship Advice of the Week. And the advice that's got me riled up this week is from a marriage counselor who says... Don't expect me to help you fix in one session what took you years to destroy. And I am so repulsed by that sentence. It makes me want to grab her imaginary french fries off of her imaginary lunch tray and dump them right on the ground. What good is that sentence doing anybody? First of all, it's dripping with judgment about how you destroyed your marriage. Oh, rump. Maybe I did at first. And then it's like a dementor from Harry Potter that sucks out all your hope because she's a professional telling you it's not going to get fixed in one day, which we all know means it's going to take a very, very long time, years maybe, and years, or possibly forever and ever. And it's going to be awful that whole time because let's not forget, according to her, you wrecked it. Now... I am smushing her imaginary french fries into the floor with the heel of my imaginary boot. It's so smarmy and condescending, like she could totally help you because she's a professional, but you can't expect much because look at you. Now I have just mentally poured her imaginary milkshake onto her smushed french fries on the ground, and it was very satisfying. So in summary, what she's saying is now you've really blown it and it's going to be a long time to fix your marriage and it's going to be hard and awful and it might not even work because you loused it up so bad. Like you weren't discouraged enough with the heartbreak and stress you've been living with all this time as if she has no idea what it's like to feel distant and stressed and lonely and hopeless about your relationship. Hmm. But she does, too. But maybe nobody ever taught her the intimacy skills either. One thing I love about the six intimacy skills is that there are practical steps to take every single day if you want to. And once you start implementing them, you you get so much insight and that gives you so much hope. Once you have hope, it's only a short hop away from having faith and being able to confidently set your intentions and manifest her to adored, happy wife. And that's such a big part of fixing your relationship, learning about your own power that you didn't know you had, and even better, learning how to use it. And you can do all of that on day one, no matter how bad it seems, no matter how long it's been. And it's a terrific feeling, actually. 
It doesn't have to take a long time to fix your relationship to make it shiny and amazing again. In my experience with helping thousands of women fix their relationships and fixing my own. And for that reason, the advice, don't expect me to help you fix in one session what took years to destroy, is the very worst relationship advice I've heard all week. Listen and subscribe to the Empowered Wife Podcast. Next week, we'll talk about three things wives get wrong about husbands. And in the meantime, I hope you're having lots of fun. Fun is so important. Today's fun fact is that I'm so good at falling asleep wherever I am. My husband calls me a sealy perfect sleeper. 